All right, class, it's seven o'clock. It's time to begin. We are looking at the resurrection of Jesus tonight. We are um, looking for not just necessarily uh, <clears throat> the case for the resurrection, but also looking at um, maybe some arguments that are used against it. I thought this lesson was particularly interesting in the fact of this minimalist uh, or minimized historical approach, which I think is a modified way of dealing with it as we're going to see in just a little bit. But making the case for the resurrection is always starting with just the historical facts. Again, we, we point out that the documents of the first century is the New Testament. They're based upon reliable documents. Now that doesn't argue for inspiration or uh, infallibility or anything along that line. It just says that we have some extant manuscripts, existing manuscripts from near the first century. And uh, that we have, we have, there's no way to put a number on the number that we have, but they all are comparatively the same and uh, you know, there are a few differences. You have them in your marginal notes, you'll see them. Uh, but they're historical documents at this point. So now what do these historical documents say? And so that's where we come to, well, this says that he was crucified, that he died, or that he and died and was buried and was resurrected. That, that, now, are these true? Are these historical events true or not? Well, this is a historical document. How does it go about trying to say that it was? And then, of course, you know, you have a number of things, but in particular, you have those that were present who were eyewitnesses. So the resurrection is a marvelous subject to talk about. Uh, before we begin, uh, we're going to go to God in a prayer, and uh, we'll uh, ask, uh, let's see who's on here, um, Charlie McPeak. Would you express a uh, word of prayer for us, please? Yeah, let us pray. If Our Heavenly family, Father. Maybe I missed it. Maybe work it. Okay. Um, well, let's just, let's just go to God in word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you and express our appreciation for all that you do for us. You love us beyond measure. Help us to love you as we should. We thank you for your word. We're thankful for Jesus who came to this earth and died and rose again for our sakes and to prove that he was, in fact, your son. We're so thankful for the evidence that points us in that direction, that it is overwhelming, and we are thankful that we have the opportunity to think about it and study it and know the implications and uh, importance to, of it for our lives. Help us, Heavenly Father, as we study this lesson. Help us to be uh, an encouragement one to another. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're looking at the resurrection then, and we'll start um, with uh, these questions here. Let me move my, all right. So uh, here is the first question. What is the purpose for using a historical minimal approach? All of these answers, of course, are in this written material. Uh, you don't have to word it exactly the way that it does. And maybe you're familiar with some of the answers without even looking at um, this material, or you have an answer that's a little bit different. Well, share that with us, and that's fine. So what are we getting at? What, what are we talking about? What is the purpose for using a historical mineral approach? What, what, what are we getting at? The case for the resurrection is found within the facts that are knowable and accepted by most who have studied them. Now notice that by most who have studied them. Not everybody that has studied the resurrection is a believer or the case for the resurrection. Uh, so, but by almost all those who have studied it, uh, the case for the resurrection is found within the facts that are knowable and accepted. And so, um, 
The purpose of using historical minimal approach is to avoid getting bogged down in the peripheral issues or getting lost in the details of certain things. And so we're that that's this historical mental approach is to say, okay, what are the facts here? And that's what we're just going to look at that. We're not going to look at how did Jesus, how long did it take him to die, you know, those sort of things, how long, uh, you know, various measurements of different things. That's not what we're interested in. We're just looking at, at the facts. Uh, so what does it mean? It means just the facts, ma'am. We're not dealing with the implications of or meaning. We're just dealing with, did this happen? Here we're reading in, the, in these historical documents that this guy named Jesus was raised from the dead. Did this happen or didn't it happen? And so that's what they're, we're, we're looking at as we think about the minimal approach. Did he die? He says he died says he was buried and then he was raised. Well, did it happen? And so we, we, we examine the text. Remember historical documents, and that is that we believe that these came from around that period of time of the first century and that these are records of what happened in the first century. And the way that the Bible is written, I mean, as we pointed out, you know, there's nobody that stood up and opposed uh, the, the, the teaching of the apostles when they talk about the resurrection. They could have done that in the very city of Jerusalem when Peter stood on the day of Pentecost and uh, they, they heard the message. This same Jesus whom you crucified, God made to be both Lord and Christ. And, you know, basically Peter uses just that sort of minimal approach. Uh, of course, he's using Old Testament scriptures, which for most of his audience, they would have been familiar with, and that would have carried another weight of evidence as well. Why is it useful for dealing with skeptics? Why is, it, why is this way of uh, minimal approach useful for dealing with skeptics? Well, obviously, uh, it keeps you from getting bogged down into the details. It just simplifies the issues. I mean, there's no point in talking about some of the details of these things never happened. There's no point in talking about, for instance, inspiration and inerrancy in the Bible if the resurrection didn't happen. I mean, that would just disprove both of those immediately. But we're not here to talk about that or how that took place or, you know, to get led off in another direction. We want to deal with just the facts, ma'am, just like uh, Dragnet. And if you don't know what Dragnet is, you'll have to ask your grandparents. Okay, so um, we'll go to question number two. What are the basic facts? Can you present them? And what significance does each fact add to the overall case? I uh, underscore that word overall case because um, one of the things about the resurrection is there are just... There's just such a compendium of evidence for it. And uh, sometimes some pieces of, like I talked to you the other day about uh, the existence of the church or the Lord's Supper. We've been doing that for 2000 years. Where does that come from? It comes from the resurrection. But that in and of itself doesn't prove the resurrection, does it? Uh, we meet on Sunday, why? Because that was the day Jesus was raised from the dead. But, but that's all testimony to that. That's all a piece of evidence. Before then, they didn't meet on the first day of the week. They met on the Sabbath, or they uh, that was their holy day. So all of these add pieces of evidence that make the case for the resurrection just overwhelming. And I mean, I'm just, uh, to me, the resurrection is to me so easy to prove, uh, you know, for somebody that's willing to listen. And if it is true, then there are some great implications. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So what are the basic facts of this historical minimal approach? And uh, can you present them? Somebody tell me one of them anyway.
the fact that Jesus died by crucifixion, uh, that's, you know, there's nobody that, that really does history. I, I don't know of anybody I've not, that, that denies that Jesus died by crucifixion. That's just a, that's just a given. Even, and, and what's interesting about this and how this adds to the overall case is that this fact is attested to by even enemies. I mean, people that weren't particularly fond of Christianity and by skeptics uh, who just couldn't deny it. Like I said, on the day of Pentecost, when Peter said, this man whom you crucified, nobody stood up and said, wait a minute, we didn't crucify anybody. That man wasn't crucified. What are you talking about? No. So then you have later Roman historians writing about it. And then you have even modern day guys, as he mentions one guy by the name of Dominic Carlson, who is an extremely liberal uh, theologian, uh, fairly decent historian though, but uh, his theology is really terrible. But he, he says it's just overwhelming that Jesus died by crucifixion, you, you know? And uh, so that's, you know, to me, that's just real weighty evidence to present to the case that, that he did die by crucifixion as he says he did, uh, as the text says he did. And, you know, in a way, this is where we talked about, um, I don't know, if several class periods back, about having secondary sources. I mean, when you have um, guys like Tacitus and um, guys like that writing about it that were uh, Roman as uh, not particularly um, fond of Christianity. Uh, you know, he was the one that said Christus was executed in the Principate of Tiberius by the governor Pontius Pilate. The deadly superstitio uh, was checked for a time, but never broke out again, not only in Judea. Uh, the origin of the evil, but even in the capital, were all hideous and shameful practices collect from every quarter and are extremely popular. And he's just simply saying, it happened, it, just what he said. Uh, saying that Christ was executed almost certainly refers to crucifixion. As I said to you the other, the other day that, uh, you know, crucifixion, the, the, the idea of crucifixion was not uh, spoken in, pi in polite society in the first century. It was such a horrible, nasty, vicious mistreatment and people just didn't talk about it. Uh, the support for Jesus' crucifixion is extensive. So the fact, number one, Jesus died by crucifixion. Secondly, the disciples believed they saw him alive after he died. Let's talk about this for just a moment. I have capitalized believed, you know. Uh, so the disciples believed they saw him alive after he died. Why, why is that different? I mean, uh, because, you know, this leads into the fact that they're willing to die. They're willing to do all these sort of things. And yet people die for causes. Um, you know, you have Jim Jones, you have uh, David Koresh, you have um, a number of people that die. What is the difference? Why, why is this important? The disciples believed they saw him. Well, in the first place, the statement in and of itself doesn't say that, that they actually saw him. In fact, uh, it doesn't say that he did or that he was raised from the dead. It just says that, that he believed, they believed it. But this gives us an idea and a link into the idea of believing something here. They believed it so much that they were... Uh, willing to go preach it and teach it. They were eyewitnesses of it, you see? And that, that's one of the difference that makes them. Here are some guys that said, we believe 
we saw him alive after he died in the same time zone, same time period. Uh, and they, they saw all these people dying for these put up causes. They're not, they're not basing anything on, on uh, firsthand testimony or things that they actually saw with their eyes. They're following blindly. And so here you have the disciples in the first century who lived and walked and talked and ate with him, as John talks about in 1 John 1. And uh, they believed they saw him alive. And they went about preaching him. They were so believable in what they preached. Everywhere the disciples went, everywhere the apostles went preaching the word, they left churches behind. And if we consider the church being established on the belief of the resurrection in Acts 2, and it's still with us today, I mean, basically, why does Perry Hill Church exist? Because we believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, based upon those who were eyewitnesses, who saw that, based upon their belief that they were even willing to die for their belief. Uh, they didn't, they weren't, you know, people that die, you know, as we say here, uh, People have died for lies throughout history. Well, that's true. Uh, but the, and, and the sincerity, as he points out on page 13a, the sincerity of those who give up their lives for a religious cause is not in question. Many people believe in their cause and act upon their faith with tremendous devotion and zeal, willing to go to their deaths because they believe so strongly. Such devotion is commendable. However, this objection misses the point. The issue is not just that believers die, but that it was those claiming to be eyewitnesses who were willing to die. And so the argument is focused on the first generation disciples, not on those who came to believe later. People who die for their faith today are not in the same position as the apostles and initial witnesses of Jesus Christ. Uh, modern martyrs act on a faith that they have been taught and received from others. The apostles, on the other hand, were making claims about what they had actually seen with their own eyes. And this means that they knew without question whether or not they were telling the truth. And modern martyrs may be claiming to believe truth, but they are not the firsthand source that the apostles claim to be, and they are not making the same type of claims. So I, I was reading that from page 13, uh, which is, this is just a really good uh, point that he makes here. Any comments or questions anybody has they want to discuss? Okay. You guys aren't very talkative tonight. Yeah. Uh, well, another point that somebody made from Daniel or Megan made that uh, some of them witnessed the ascension to heaven too after he proved who he was by showing them the scars. That's a good point. And so, you know, the, these were eyewitnesses. To, to all of this stuff. And, and uh, again, uh, the evidence is overwhelming. Okay. I like that. That was good. Anything else? Okay. Fact four, the tomb was found empty on the third day after. Did I miss one? I thought I, I, think I missed one. Oops. I accidentally left out Paul, didn't I? Well, I, I guess I didn't mean to, but there is a third fact, and that is uh, the, the uh, testimony of Paul, or Saul of Tarsus, the conversion, I'm sorry, the conversion should be fact number three. Maybe that's in here, and I just got it backward. Yeah, okay, there it is. The conversion of Saul of Tarsus is another uh, case in point. I mean, here's somebody that, that persecuted Christians, somebody that hated Jesus, and now has surrendered his life completely to him. I mean, what he says in Galatians 1, 
uh, and toward the end of the first chapter of Galatians 1, let me get the verse for you. I'll just read it. Galatians 1 and verse 22, he said, and I was still, he's talking about after his conversion, and I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only were hearing it said. He who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. So that's, you know, that, that's pretty important evidence there. I um, can't remember who the, I mean, several people have looked at what has converted people to be believers has been Saul of Tarsus' conversion. Uh, to see the, the turnaround, the change in his life and preaching and all that and what he has done. That has been the source for several uh, highly intelligent people to turn their uh, lives around and, and, and believe in the resurrection of Jesus. Number fact four, the tomb was found empty on the third day after Jesus died by crucifixion. And what we know about that tomb is Matthew 27, verse 57 tells us it's a new tomb where never a man laid. Why is that important? Well, when the body was gone, they couldn't say, well, they, they, they mistook the body or they took the wrong body or, you know, something else. There's a body still there. No, nobody had ever been in that tomb. And so it was a fresh tomb. Then it was observed in, in Mark 15, verse 47 by the uh, women that were there. What the text tells us in verse 47 is uh, Mary Magdalene and mother, Mary the mother of Joseph saw where he was laid. So they were, they, they were visual witnesses to where he was laid in the tomb. And it was an empty tomb and it was where nobody had ever laid before. They were, they were well aware of that. And then what we find is that uh, you know, they went to Pontius Pilate and asked for a guard to be placed around it, and they sealed it with the uh, wax sealed, you know, around it, and and then put a guards put guards all around it. So, you know, here is a new tomb where nobody ever laid. Here's where they saw him laid, and then they secured it because they they said, "Well, this deceiver has told people that he's going to be raised from the dead third day," and and we just want to make sure he's not out of there. And, and so we want this guard placed there. Well, they put a, you know, I mean, they were there on the, on the penalty of death if he gets away. And that's made clear in the later lie that they told about, well, just tell him that you were asleep. We'll cover for you. Uh, and then he just, the disciples came and stole his body while he was asleep. Well, where's his body? You know? The disciples wouldn't have died, wouldn't have stole his body and then died for it and then went around telling everybody he was raised from the dead. Bill, that's the key point. So they, they, they acknowledge Yeah, I was, was just going to say, Bill, can you hear me? Bill, can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you, Reagan. His sound is down. Okay. Uh, just that's the key point. Is that they've acknowledged the body was there? Not not the skeptics acknowledged um, his body was there. All right. And I'm looking then at question number three, Bill. Oh. Hey, I had you all muted. Sorry about that. That's right. <laughs> Sorry, Judy. I'm glad Judy's listening. Well, you know what? I was just yeah, saying. We, you know, we've been grateful for Judy too. I kept hearing Judy, and I thought, well, she must be in the other class. She's not in our class. Nobody's saying anything. I had my volume out. Sorry. All right. Who was talking? Go ahead. Uh, it's me. It's Reagan. Um, I, I, the, the key point is, is that you have the, the skeptics acknowledging that the tomb was filled, the tomb was sealed. Now the tomb is empty. They, they you know, so in, I guess in a, in a legal argument or a, a debate or whatever, you're playing on their side of the field already because they're on the defensive trying to explain away what has actually, you know, the thing that has happened. Yeah. And so yeah. that, that's the, that's the beauty of the, of the argument now is that we're not arguing about whether anybody was ever in there. We're not arguing about right. did this happen. 
they're trying to explain away why what happened what happened the way happen. that it did. Yeah, yeah, that, and that is, you know, again, one of those deals where they sort of meet themselves coming back. And um, so um, the and and again, it's if you've got kids in here, I'm going to mention something about Christmas you don't want me to say yet. So if you've got kids in the room, just cover their ears because I'm going to talk about something here in a second. I don't want to. I don't want to be a spoiler here. Um, but you know, nobody goes around trying to prove the existence of Santa. Nobody goes around doing that. Uh, so it's always been the irony that people try to go disprove God. If God is just Santa, then why, you know, so there's something to it is the, is the point that I'm making there. And uh, so, which is sort of a left-handed way of what Reagan was saying as well, that, you know, it, it, the question now is, did it happen? Uh, not did it happen, it did happen. Now, how are we going to explain it? And so we have to come up with these alternative theories about what happened. And, you know, almost, I, I can remember, um, well, back in the middle 70s or so, uh, the swoon theory was, was, was fairly, you know, not by everybody, but it was certainly a lot more in vogue. It has been so destroyed that nobody ever makes an argument. And the swoon theory was that Jesus didn't really die on the cross, that he just kind of went into an unconsciousness and, and they laid him in the tomb and then he was raised. Well, that just has all sorts of problems with it. I mean, who moved the stone? I mean, who, who uh, were, were not the Roman centurions experts in death? Of course they were. And coming to his body, seeing that he was dead already, they break down his bones. I mean, they were experts at death. So there's just a lot of things wrong with that. They ran a spear through him. Pardon me? They ran a spear through him. Yeah. There you go. They ran a spear through it. Yeah. Okay. Well, I apologize to you if you all have been talking and I didn't hear you. I thought, man, they're really quiet tonight. I had my volume down. Sorry. Okay. So what is the relevance of the empty tomb and why is that alone not sufficient to prove the resurrection? Well, you remember the women thought the body had been taken when you, when you read John's account. They thought somebody had taken the body. Uh, they were perplexed, I think. Um, maybe Matthew says it. Um, or maybe Luke. But anyway, they, they were a little surprised. And then you remember when the, they came back and told the, the, the male disciples, and then Peter and John took off running toward the tomb, and uh, I, I want to read just verses three through eight of John 20. And um, the text says, so Peter went out with the other disciple and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloth lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus's head, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. For as it yet, they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. What did they see when they saw the grave clothes? Why were they enlightened by that? Were you talking about how they were neatly arranged? Yes. I mean, neatly arranged doesn't mean that, uh, um, you know, and some intelligence had to do that. I mean, you because, you know, that wasn't. Uh, and it looked like everything was laid out in place where it was supposed to have been. Uh, well, it was a matter of effort. Yeah. Intent. Go ahead. Matter of effort and intent. 
Yes. It's also just not how a, a grave robber would have done it. <laughs> exactly. Or if to deal with the swoon theory, if Jesus had somehow walked out of there because he hadn't been killed, he wouldn't have done that either. Right. So it was not the night of the living dead. Let me put it to you that way. And his, and his friends, his friends could not have stolen, his friends could not have stolen him because the guard was there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you know, I mean, it's, it, it is almost humorous, is it not? I mean, to read that and then to try to figure out what they did and how they lied about it. And I mean, it just, it's so ironic uh, what they did. I think the other thing is the empty tomb is a necessary condition, but it's not sufficient evidence by itself to prove a resurrection. For the disciples did not believe because of an empty tomb. Their faith rested on the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead because they believed and saw firsthand. And uh, it's always interesting to me, uh, especially in John's gospel, or he, he makes a statement a couple of different times. They didn't come to believe this until after the resurrection. And uh, so the resurrection tied their, their faith is everything in, in that resurrection. The teaching of Jesus, the things that Jesus told them, they didn't believe it until the resurrection because they believed in him in a way that they hadn't believed in him before. Um, so it's just an interesting situation. Any comments? All good comments. All right, let me go to the next chart. So why is the resurrection so vital to the Christian faith, and what, what are the consequences if it did not happen? I mean, and you don't have to follow the book here. He didn't give an exhaustive list of, of things. I mean, if somebody just walked up to you right now and said, why, why is the resurrection so important to Christians? What would you say? What would be the first thing off your head? Bill? Yeah. If Christ wasn't raised, how do we have hope that we will be raised? There you go. We have no hope. Uh, you know, if he's not raised, then why, why would we have any hope at all? Which is a point that Paul makes First 1 Corinthians 15. Anybody have anything different? Something else I'm going to add, or something out of the book here. Why is, it, why is the resurrection important to you? Why is the resurrection important to you? I mean, for me personally, he's a go ahead. Because he's a living sacrifice. It's not a one and done sacrifice, but he's alive and he's in standing uh, as a defense for us, as a as a propitiation for us. And it's not done if he died once and walked away, but it's a, uh, or he did die once, but it's a, a living sacrifice. It is something that's still perpetual, still going on. Yeah, that through, through that sacrifice, he's able to uh, be our high priest and, and uh, offer his blood as a total yes. offense. You know, Bill, I'd say, and this is a peculiar way to put it, but I'm a peculiar person. Yes. We think of the two great commandments on which hang the law and the prophets. This action is what <laughs> hangs on the, the law and prophets. I mean, this is what we led to. This is I mean, it just, if, if we don't have it, it falls apart. I mean, it kind of goes back to where what Charlie said, if, if we don't have this, we don't have anything. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. I mean, that, and that is so true. I mean, uh, the whole law of the prophets hang on love. And of course, the greatest expression of love here. And um, yeah, all of that, that's good. But I was going to say, from my point of view, I mean, just uh, why it's important to my faith is it just makes everything believable. If I can believe that God can raise Jesus from the dead, I don't struggle with how did God part the Red Sea or how did that fish appear or that great fish appear at the right time and swallow Jonah and then spit him. If God can raise him from the dead, I mean, or how how, how is it that a virgin gave birth? How did God do that? You know, um, I, I just take it at face value. Like my friend Matthew Conley says, well, the Bible said that I just believe it. And that, that's sort of that. If you get to that point of the resurrection, it just, 
ties everything on the peripheral together, as we've used that illustration together about the jigsaw puzzle and pulling all the parts into the middle where that final scene is there that finally makes sense of the whole puzzle we've been putting together. The resurrection does that for me personally. I mean, seriously, when I, when I struggle with a passage of scripture and I think, all right, what, what, what is the point of that? And I know that some way that the resurrection answers that. And I don't mean says, Hey, look what David did. Here's the resurrection. answer. No, I don't mean that. I mean that it puts it in perspective and I, I don't, I don't get upset about that. And I'll tell you what, what the other thing I want to su suggest to you about that is that And this is actually what I'm saying to you. I build my faith on what I do know, not what I don't know. And the resurrection to me is so over, the evidence for the resurrection is just so overwhelming to me. I mean, I don't, it's hard for me to understand how people miss it, but I don't mean that in a bad way. And I do understand why they miss it on the other hand uh, sometimes. Uh, but picking up the evidence for yourself and reading it and coming to, an understanding of it, I, I, it's, to me, it's just overwhelming. And I, I couldn't, you'd have an awful hard time to convince me of the resurrection. And I don't think you could. At least I hope you never can, because I believe it's true. If it did, I wouldn't be in my right mind. So that's some things personal to me. Anybody have anything else? Why the resurrection is so vital to your faith? Bill? Yes. In the latter part of Acts, one of the things, and I don't know if this adds anything to the discussion, but in the latter chapters of Acts, when Paul begins to defend himself before the various governors and kings and so on, and when he argues for the Christian faith, um, I guess the epitome of this is when he says, you know, this thing was not done in a corner. Yeah. The thing that is really awe-inspiring to me about that is that it's not only an appeal to, you know, something that supposedly happened a few decades earlier. Right. But also just, well, I'm reminded of the old Palm Olive commercial, you know, you're soaking in it. The very fact that this thing is happening um, the very fact that we're standing here, the very fact that all of this is going on is just, I think Paul is in a way demonstrating that this is just more proof that this thing, which did not happen in a corner, is a valid basis for your life. That's, that's a great point. Uh, you know, I never thought about it like that, but that's a good point because he starts out that same defense. When he said, why, do you, why would it be judged by any of you that God could raise the dead? And then he goes into his argument and comes there. And the point being, as you said, if it didn't happen, why am I here? Why are we having this argument? Uh, so that's a good point. I like that a lot. Hey, Bill. This is yes. Um, I was going to say also, when you think about other religions, yep. like Muhammad and uh, I don't know, uh, Buddha, when you think uh -huh. about that, they didn't, they didn't come back from death like Jesus did. And so that just kind of is reassuring as a Christian to know that your leader of God, you know, he did come back and he, he's living and he's saving us. Whereas their leaders have died. They haven't come back, you know? Yeah. No, that's a good point. I mean, who would you rather follow a guy that had been raised from the dead or a guy that never came back and just left some writings and, and you can't make sense of some of it. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, yeah, our leader has, well, that's why he's referred to as the pioneer, um, you know, the captain of our salvation. You know, in the, in the movie line, he has gone where no other man has gone. You know, he went, he went to death and came back again in, on earth. Uh, good, good, good discussion. Anybody have anything else? So the implication of the resurrection obviously have eternal consequences. Another favorite passage of mine is Acts 17, verse 30, because it's, to me, it's just, it's pretty straightforward, this conclusion to Paul's 
preaching at Mars Hill. To me, it's at least in my mind, it's just pretty straightforward. When he says, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. So the implication is God's going to judge the world because of the resurrection. He's given assurance to us. The other thing that that passage, same passage implies is that Jesus's resurrection is the assurance of our resurrection. If he's going to judge the world in righteousness, then he's going to have to raise people from the dead. Jesus, the fact that he was raised from the dead, I can believe he's going to raise me from the dead. So uh, those are the things to, uh, you know, that, I, that to me, that's just pretty straightforward in that text. Uh, anybody have anything else? Uh, this was this was Charlie McPeak's point. We have a living hope. First Peter one three. We've been begotten again by a living hope. Uh, Jesus Christ by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Death has been conquered. Hebrews two verse fourteen through seventeen. Who all through all their life were subject to the fear of death, but when Christ broke the bonds of death and being raised, you know death has no more dominion over us uh, to those who are in Christ. Yes, we're still going to have to die, but it can't hold us in the grave. Christ is going to raise us victorious. Uh, it makes our faith valid and worthwhile. And that's all tied into that as well. So those are some things I thought of. I mean, some of this is in the book. Uh, I worded some of it a little bit different. Uh, some of it's not. Any kind of other comments or questions? All right, we can go to the last one real quick for the next three or four minutes. Why? Oh, one of the consequences, if it didn't happen, we are of all men most pitiable, or, you know, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 14 through 19. I mean, we, we're to be pitied if, we, if the resurrection didn't happen and we uh, believed that it did happen when it didn't happen. I mean, we might as well, I don't know, go handle snakes. I don't know. But anyway, it's, it just doesn't make any sense. All right, so let's, this last question, discuss the Lordship of Jesus. What does it mean to call him Lord? So let's talk about that a little bit. What does the Lordship of Jesus mean? I'm going to call on some, because I know we've, you've thought about this, especially I know where you come from. What does the Lordship of Jesus mean? What does it mean to call him Lord? It means he's Lord of the universe. Sovereignty, yeah, he's sovereign. He has absolute control and authority. I mean, that's, we use the word a lot, sovereign. He's the sovereign Lord. I mean, he has absolute control over everything. Um, and nothing is, all things are held together by him. Yeah. Bill, yes, that's please. Probably the hardest thing for us to come to grips with and deal with. It's, it's easy to view Jesus as a savior that, died on the cross for our sins the real part the tough part is to make him lord of your life amen and we all struggle with that at different levels different places different times under different circumstances and um you know all of our jobs present their own issues that we have to remember that we are serving the lord um, to call him lord means that we are submitting to his will exactly Laura that we're submitting to his will that we're doing his bidding and how do I know that well I put the I just wrote down some scriptures Romans 1 4 the resurrection was the evidence that Jesus was raised from the dead so if he is and, and that he was the son of God I should have said Romans 1 verse 4 the fact that he was raised from the dead is evidence that he was the son of God and so if we believe the resurrection then we should be willing to confess him and uh, Romans 10, 9 and 10. And uh, John 6, verse 68. Well, John 20, verse 28 is where Thomas said, unless I put my hands uh, in there, and we should be able to say with Thomas, my Lord and my God. And Peter understood that to mean, to whom shall we go, Lord? Thou hast the words of eternal life. You know, upon hearing his sermon on the bread of life, many turn and walk with him no more. And Jesus said to him, will you go away also? 
And Peter said, to whom shall we go? Thou hast, to whom shall we go, Lord? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And then Luke 6, verse 46, is where Jesus says to the disciples, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things that I say? So that's Laura's point about submitting to Jesus, to his will, to doing what he said. Look at Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but whosoever doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. For many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Have we not cast out demons in thy name? Have we not done many wonderful works in thy name? So, he, you know, here they're calling on the name of the Lord. Here they're, they're saying all this, but Jesus says what to them? But I will profess unto them, depart from me, I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. So just, just saying, and, and I think this goes to Reagan's point, just saying that you believe that Jesus is Lord. I mean, while it is easy to believe that he died on the cross, we struggle with the idea of lordship and, and sometimes uh, in, in different ways. And just, just being able to say, Lord, uh, I believe the Lord or call on the name of the Lord or doing something in the name of the Lord. You know, people always say, well, if you do something in the name of the Lord, it's okay. Well, to do something in the name of the Lord means what? It has to first be authorized by Jesus. What Colossians 3 verse 17 says, whatsoever you do in word and deed, do all by the authority of Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God and the Father through him. So we can't do anything without the authority of Jesus. And so uh, we can't call upon his name unless we're operating by the authority of Jesus, or as Laura said, submitting to his will. And then we can, because we're doing what the Bible tells us to do. Uh, when Ananias came to Saul of Tarsus, he said, Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And so he was saying you can appeal to the authority of the Lord to have your sins washed away because this is what he commanded you to do. All right, our time is up. Lesson 14 is a testimony of Paul for Sunday afternoon. So I hope you all will read that and I'll make sure my volume's up Sunday so you, I can hear those good comments. Sorry I did that earlier. Uh, so anyway, uh, Ron, you've got yes. okay. Good evening. Great to see everyone. Um, we're going to ask uh, James Powell to lead us in our closing prayer in a moment, and then uh, have a couple of other things to, to say. I uh, hope everybody had a great Bible study. Uh, we had, a, I think, a pretty good discussion on John chapter 12 and Mary anointing the feet of Jesus and what that all meant and the Greeks coming to see Jesus, and we'll continue that, Lord willing, on Sunday night. I want to remind everyone of our of our theme for the year, and hopefully everyone has it memorized by now and, and meditating, for we've been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer we, me that live, but Christ that lives in me and died for me and loved me so much that he did die. Great to see everyone. Brother James, would you lead us in a word of closing prayer? Would you bow with me, please? Our God and Heavenly Father, we come before thee this evening praising thy holy name, praising thee for this great opportunity that we've had to assemble ourselves in this manner to study from thy holy and divine will, that we can learn and understand more about thee and we can know how that we can live for thee and model our lives after thee each day. We're thankful for these classes. We pray that we have gained from them in order that would draw us closer to thee and closer to one another. We're thankful, dear Heavenly Father, for all of the blessings that you have provided us with. And we're especially thankful, Father, for this church, the body of thy people as they assemble together. We ask the dear Heavenly Father to 
go with us through the remainder of this week as we are allowed to journey in this life. Give us the peace and understanding and may we look forward to being together this Sunday morning to worship the, the true and the living God. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, James.